Hello everyone and welcome. So in today's video I'm going to focus on Dungeon Dragon's most formidable villain, Vecna. I will then delve into his backstory or lore to see what pivotal moments turn this once human king into the monster we know today. Like all good villain stories, Vecna starts in tragic circumstances, but to document his rise to evil I'm going to use Fatark's pyramid that will break up Vecna's story into five arcs or chapters. So at the bottom of the pyramid we have the introduction. This established the character and the environment. Here I've written, Vecna is an orphan. His mother was a hedge witch. She lived in Uith. An order of wizards accused her of practicing necromancy and exiled her. She had to leave Vecna behind with the wizards and he was bound to a life of servitude. As a young boy, he worked as a shoe polisher and then as a scribe. He hated the wizards for what they did to him and his mother. Next, we have Rise, or Rise in Action. This is where things start to heat up and Vecna's story begins. Vecna swears revenge against the cruel wizards and makes a point of studying in secret. He wants to grow more powerful than the wizard order who exiled his mother and bowed him to a life of service. The more he studies, the more a disembodied voice speaks to him, encouraging him to seek revenge. At this point, Vecna is at the edge of making some big decisions. When he acts, he moves into the climax level of Fatark's Pyramid. The climax is a point of no return and his world is turned upside down. Here, Vecna destroys the wizard order that robbed him and his mother, but the more his power grows, the more proud he becomes. On the night he destroyed the wizard order, he begins writing the Book of Old Darkness at the behest of that ominous voice. It is a wicked text that records his foul thoughts and dreams. It's said to drive mortals mad if they read it. He goes on to conquer and capture more land throughout Oith. After Vecna's world has changed, he's heading for tragedy. This is a rise and fall of the pyramid. Decades later, Vecna begins to grow old and fears his weakening body will make him vulnerable, like he was when he was an orphan. He's incensed that he has come so far only to see his body gradually give up. Given all he has been through and achieved, he thinks he has a right to immortality. Later, he achieves it, though it isn't clear how. Some say he confronted his own death and imprisoned it. Others say his arrogance offended the deities, so they cursed him to live between the living and the dead. He becomes a lich. So Vegna has cheated death, what's next? He's heading for catastrophe. When a character reaches catastrophe, the inevitable becomes true. Vegna, now immortal, amasses a loyal following of lieutenants over the years as he continues to conquer other worlds. His most revered though is Kaz, a ruthless and cruel paladin. Vegna gives Kaz a powerful and also sentient sword, forged from the heart of the frozen star. Over time, the sword corrupts Kaz and he tries to murder Vegna with it. Before Vecna's physical form is destroyed, he flings Kaz into the Domain of Dread in the Shadowfell. Vecna's spirit then traverses the multiverse and only his hand and eye remain in their physical form. Vecna regains enough power from his followers as they worship him to reclaim his physical form. After many trials and tribulations, he finally ascends to godhood, but he has isolated himself in the process, creating a long list of enemies who want him dead, or at least banished, including his once close friend Kaz. While he may have gained formidable powers, he is, in some ways, just as vulnerable as he was when he was a child. So what are Vecna's goals now? He's achieved godhood. What's next? Well, his insatiable urge to become the most powerful being in the universe has set him on a course to use the ritual of remaking to recreate the universe exactly how he wants it. He wants everyone to serve him as he had to serve the wizard order when he was a child. But what makes Vecna so special? Why is he one of D&D's most formidable villains? I think it's because historically Vecna's origins can be traced back to the early version of Dungeons and Dragons. His lore goes back to the 70s, not to mention his place is cemented in pop culture, inspiring a supervillain in Stranger Things. But Vecna did not start out as a lich god we know today. The basis for his story began as two magical body parts, the eye and the hand of Vecna. These two magical artifacts are still very much part of Vecna's lore, but it's funny to think about Vecna beginning just as a hand and eye. So in 1976, the Eldritch Wizardry Supplement was published by Gary Gygax and Brian Blum. This supplement was actually a rulebook for the original edition and also included extras such as the Druid class. But more importantly, this is where the eye and hand of Vecna first make their appearance. The supplement describes the hand as the remains of a lich and appears dried, shriveled and blackened. Apparently the lich was so powerful, these relics retained a lot of their magical potency. The hand and eye law naturally left a lot of unanswered questions, such as who was Vecna and why was or is he so powerful? This then opened the stage for the Vecna we know today. 
Okay, so we've got a good idea about Vecna and his origins. But what about his minions or creatures that are drawn to him? Let's not forget, he wouldn't have been able to reach godhood without drawing power from his worshippers. So, if we think back to Vecna's arc, he wanted to avoid death, not because he was scared of it, but because he thought he deserved immortality. His followers want the same thing, but their motivation is different. Consequently, Vecna tends to attract anything or anyone who fears dying and has a short lifespan. However, once they're within Vecna's clutches, they become expendable and serve him as cultists. With all that in mind though, how does someone go about playing Vecna? If we reflect or think back to Vecna's path to immortality, he became a lich. Yet there are other ways to say cheat in death. What sets a lich apart from something else though, is that they crave power and they use this power to dominate or destroy others. Some may even want a bit of both, depending on their alignment. Okay, so to play a lich like Vecna, it's important to keep in mind the desire to dominate and control. How do you actually play that? Well, when it comes to choosing spells, Dominate Monster is a great example, as it ticks all those boxes. You can also change the class of the lich to get a different range of spells. Instead of wizard spells, you might be able to use druid spells that have a lot more decaying and fungal flavour. My favourite or most nasty lich spells tend to be 6 level. Here, a lich can cast Disintegrate, and the only way to be brought back is with either True Resurrection or Wish. Another thing to think about is consistency. Now, this is important for playing a villain, regardless of who they are. Nobody does anything that's random, unless they're a little chaotic, of course. But even in those situations, the randomness is usually linked to some sort of life experience. This is when strategy comes into play. So in playing your lich, go back to their motivations. Do they want to dominate by control or destruction? Keeping this in mind will help you build a spell routine. If destruction is your thing, you may want to focus on some nasty spells that inflict an excessive amount of damage. Opening the first round with Psychic Scream, for example, could result in some pretty horrific head pops when a player's HP is reduced to zero. However, when playing a Lich, the main goal is to have fun. Leaning into the character and role-playing the ultimate villain should be entertaining. Perhaps you bellow a maniacal laugh when casting Fireball after someone's head pops. Having a detailed plan of combat is great, but don't let it come at a cost to the actual gameplay. If you feel you're getting too lost in the spell routine, loosen it up a bit and go with intuition. You've likely invested a lot of time in your Lich's backstory and build, so you hopefully know enough to go off script every now and then. Now, I'm not saying don't make a plan, as I highly recommend it. I'm just suggesting that if following the plan is becoming too overwhelming, don't let it affect the gameplay, as the whole point of the plan is to carry some of the cognitive load, so you can put more energy into the characterization and role-playing. Right, that's all for today, folks, and I'll see you in the next one.